Well, hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Startup Studios podcast, uh, where we interview people who build startups with Raj and Seth. How are you doing, Raj? Man, I'm good, brother. How about yourself? How was Easter good weekend? Good weekend. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was fun, right? Um, it was. It's starting to get a little hotter over here, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, You'll be okay. All that good weather is gone. But uh, Raj, I am so excited to introduce one of my. Well, one of my favorite people, but then also a superpower in everything I've done uh, with startups is somebody who I met very, very early on in my career when I was a wannabe VC and, you know, running a so-called accelerator program. But um, Roger has been a, he he was a a board member at our initial uh, accelerator startups. He was the first startup lawyer who I ever worked with and a lot of what I learned about how to work with entrepreneurs and not only that, but then how can some, how should somebody who's so accomplished work with young founders who don't know jack shit that I learned a lot about that from our next guest. So Roger, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to have you. Cool. Well, it's good to hear from you again. It's been a while and uh, <laughs> interesting to see how far you've come. I remember those early days when we had our madman lunches uh, in Palo Alto and brainstormed. Yep. And actually, uh, so Rod, before uh, um, uh, we go into your introduction, I want to give you a little context about not only how we met Roger, but then also how we decided to work with him. Because so um, when we started startups and then, you know, we uh, ran Emeka and myself had also gone through our own startups and uh, our own kind of, um, you know, work. And in those days, this is like 2010, 2011, incubators, accelerators aren't really necessarily all the rage, but there are people who are in the industry who are looking at, you know, at, at these eco or, or at these communities. And we were fortunate where anytime, you know, part of the reason why I said, you know, I was starting an accelerator is so I could open whatever doors I, I wanted to. Um, uh, and in a, in many cases, a lot of the lawyers, a lot of the the other kind of um, you know ecosystem players, they would get attracted to you and say, "Oh yeah, you know, we'd absolutely love to work with you. Here's how we work with uh, early stage companies or your portfolio, blah blah blah." But a lot of them would only the 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 partner level or above or no, let's say uh, partners um, at these uh, these name brands, they would invite you over to their offices, you know, wine and dine you, but everything else would happen with their associates. Roger was one of those people who, whichever event we, we'd go to, whether it was, um, you know, a small like 20, 30 person um, at, at like a, a coffee shop or at, you know, a Chinese restaurant, Roger would be there. I remember this, he'd have this little trolley bag with all his stuff with like projectors and stuff. And he would show up, he would set up in a corner and the owner of the firm is there pitching right alongside. And it, not just once, but most of the time when we would be going to like partner events, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, conferences and stuff, Roger would be there in the same same mindset as we were, which is always be closing. So when we went through the rounds, we we spoke with maybe five or six different law, law firms. And every time when we would t- talk to Roger, it would we would feel like we were getting so much more value than what was on paper at the time. And it, it became not only a very easy decision, but then we were so happy after the fact. We worked together almost three and a half, four years. Um, Any time I had a question, hey, uh, you know, text Roger or email Roger, call back. Hey, what's up? I'm over in Palo Alto. Come meet me either for a drink or I'm over here, et cetera. Hang out. Or is this a quick question? We can handle it himself. He never passed it off, except maybe some of the early per- paperwork for our incorporation stuff. We worked with some of his associates for that. but. Everything else on the advisory level was direct from the source. And that I don't feel like you you really get that until you're a certain size. And we we were zero at the time. We had uh, uh, we wanted to build the accelerator. We were looking for a fund. Um, we had, uh, you know, some small grant money for the space and whatnot in San Jose. But nothing, in my opinion, that warranted somebody of his, his caliber. And, uh, um, I, I know some a little bit about about his story as uh, you know following him for about ten plus years, but uh, the what this man brings to the table, whether it's you're a pre seed company or a Series G company, is unmatched. And so um, 
we're gonna go dive dive into Roger's story. But Roger, before we uh we get into that, I'd love to introduce uh my buddy Raj, who also has a very interesting background. But um, yeah, go for it, bro. I appreciate it, Seth. And and Roger, I'm super excited. I mean. I've seen so much interesting plays and 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 uh, iterations of Seth and what he can do. It, it'd be really really cool to see who could keep up with him because uh, you know half the time I'm like what what we were just talking about dolphins. How are we on school buses right now, man? Like what like what's going on here? I was lucky enough though to have kind of an eclectic background as well. Um, mother, dad, you know, mom, dad, sister, brother, all physicians, kind of the typical immigrant mentality. Um, so I had to go to medical school. Uh, I, I let my parents down and quit. And I actually went straight to Goldman and, uh, did some banking for about a year left there. Cause I knew I wanted to run a fund, uh, cobbled together about 70 grand and over about 12 years, uh, built out a billion two in, uh, an alternative investment fund. So we had four subsequent funds with some institutional advisors and uh, institutional players, had an exit, kind of became a dad, retired, moved to Jacksonville, Wyoming and Seattle then and followed my passion in health and wellness, did a direct consumer brick and mortar and from it a SaaS solution. So kind of on the startup tech side, pretending my best, but a, definitely a, a southerner from Texas and Seattle trying to be a, a startup. So it's been a lot of fun. I was lucky enough to meet Seth and kind of follow his his verbiage and, and his skill set across all industries, which I think is awesome. I'm um, on LinkedIn, kind of reached out and have had some great time learning how to build. I'll have plenty of questions. Yeah, cool. Well, you know, you guys are doing so good. I think I, I, I feel like I get the best seat in the house here. I think I just sit here and listen to you talk about me all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that because uh, we're going to end the episode with like major flowers and gratitude for everything you've done. So a little more deep dive. But right now, this episode is all about you and your story. So with that being said, Roger, we'd love for you to start us off with who is Roger Royce? Yeah, uh, cool. So um, I've been, I came here to California temporarily 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I was right here at the, uh, you know, there was definitely a tech boom, what we thought was a tech boom going on then, but um, boy, nothing like what we've got now. I mean, I knew this was the center of the universe when I got here. And I came out here for lifestyle. I, I came here from New York City. I was with a big law firm on Wall Street. Uh, doing deals that you'd read about in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal every Monday, uh, which was really heady stuff. You know, big, you know, big company clients, celebrity clients, um, you know, just uh, deals that people talk about still today. Of course, my piece of it was pretty tiny, but they were, you know, it was cool to be involved in it. So it was a much different thing. And I, um, I'll just tell you the story how I got here, I guess, to start, and then I'll go back a little uh, my boss in New York, uh, and by the way, I started my practice in the Midwest. I'm from North Dakota, and I started in Fargo, North Dakota, practicing, and I had a great time doing that. Uh, but uh, through a, a series of events, I ended up in New York City, got an advanced degree in tax law at NYU, and then decided to stick around and be a tourist for a little while longer. Went to work for a big New York City law firm. Uh, my boss was a truly awful, awful individual, uh, and uh, to, and and one one of the things he did to punish me one day is he sent me out on on location to California for two weeks uh, to work for one of our big clients out here. It was a big motion picture studio, so here I was living on a set. Uh, I was having my lunch at the commissary, and all these you know, John Travolta be walking by, you know, all these big actors, and at least they were big back then. Uh, were hanging out and um and it, i remember that the day that i came out here it was it was uh, a march day in new york city and it was a miserable rainy sleet you know cold uh you know i think i was probably hung over um and uh, it was just a miserable day and uh, getting on that plane and i got off the plane in california and it was sunny and warm and everybody's friendly um you know, and like everyone was friendly. I said, man, they love me in this state, you know? <laughs> so I, I came to find out that that's just the way Californians are. They're, they just tend to be pretty upbeat compared to East Coast people. No offense if you guys are from the East Coast, but it's a little different culture. So um, so my uh, bar application for California, they beat me back to New York City. Uh, cause, uh, I said, this is where I want to go. I can't believe people actually live like that. <laughs> this is a place we go to vacation, you know? 
And I interviewed all up and down the West Coast, and I thought I'd end up in L.A. with all the movie stars. But um, then I came to Silicon Valley and saw what was going on in tech. And But again, it was really more of a lifestyle decision. Um, there was a very active community here. I mean, I was here for a few days to interview, and during that time, I did a 10K in San Jose. Then I did a big bike ride with a bunch of people I met. And... Um, you know, went out to Santa Cruz and saw the ocean. And I said, yeah, that's where I'm going. And, uh, you know, I started, you know, in tax, started as a tax lawyer. And over the years, kind of gradually drifted into business tax. And uh, I was with um, um, a, a couple of firms uh, in the Silicon Valley here that you probably know of. And one day I was at a wedding and I ran into the, uh, the legendary... Uh, uh, Larry Sansini from Wilson Sansini and we got to talk and he says what do you do and I says I'm a business tax lawyer and uh, you know Larry I got to tell you I'm sort of thinking of starting my own firm and he says you would do really well with that you know with that background and he's the only person who encouraged me to do it like the only person like everybody else like what are you crazy tax lawyers can't you know can't have their own practice you got to work for somebody else Uh, but there was a guy that I figured probably knew something about starting a law firm. And in fact, my first office was in the first Wilson Sonsini office. Um, yeah, same building. Um, you know, they started there 20 were, years before I got Were there. they still on Sand Hill at the time or nearby? No, this is over on El Camino. It's the old Bank of America. They've torn it down since then. Um, so they were there when they, that firm was there when they first built it. And I was there when they tore it down. <laughs> Um, and I started with, it was just me, um, and uh, we quickly ramped up, and by the time I exited my law firm three years ago, we had 30 lawyers, and and I'm as much of a startup as any of my clients. I mean, I know exactly what they go through, right? I know what it's like to have to make payroll. Uh, I know what it's like to you know have to negotiate a lease and not know if you're getting screwed or not. And I know what it's like, the frustration. I mean, my first meeting, I'm not making this up. We just sit on the floor because I furniture people didn't get there anytime near when they said they would. Um, IT was a nightmare. I mean, I know what you guys go through. Um, and um, and and then the, the personal investment. I mean, it costs a lot of money. I, I started with big ambitions, so I rented a lot of space and I signed a long lease. It was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. Uh, but I just knew that, you know, that there was a need in this valley, that there was an underserved community and a startup community. And uh, we seized it and, uh, and, and grew it really well uh, for 15 years. And three years ago, I... Uh, found a big, big law firm that I really like. And I talked to all of them, but I really liked Haynes Boone. And uh, we moved over here. And the reason why it was a, uh, since I'm among friends, uh, I will tell you it was a little bit of push, a little bit of pull. Uh, The push was I kind of got tired of doing everything myself. And when I say everything, you're not kidding, Safe. When you said you saw me showing up at these meetings, you know, lugging boxes in full of stuff, I did everything myself. Uh, you know, and if something went wrong, if uh, a fire alarm went off at two in the morning, I was a guy who'd get the call and have to drive to the office and, you know, figure out what's going on. So it was nice to be able to find a place that could kind of take that off my shoulders. But the bigger reason is my clients out here, here in Silicon Valley, we see explosive growth. That's what we're about. World changing ideas. Right. And once they catch on, they grow like wildfire. Not all of them. And I've still got investments in 20 year old startups. But for the most part, that's what happens. And those companies get really big and really fast. And they get to the point where a 30 lawyer law firm just can't service them anymore. So I'd have to hand all those companies off just when they were about to do, you know, their their big flashy, you know, read about it in a newspaper transaction. And it's like, wow, wouldn't it be great if I could just find a platform where I got expertise around me, regulatory, FDA, securities, corporate tax, all that stuff, so I can stay with them. And I'm happy to say I've, I have. In fact, I was in New York City last week. One of my clients went public, um, and I was there at NASDAQ for the opening bell ceremony, the first time in my career. 
not the first client I've had to go public. First time I was ever around by the time it happened though. So it's, and it's really fun to see the back end, to see the fruit of all that work on a front end when everybody goes through. Now, most of our exits are sales for sure. Public, you know, even a DSPAC transaction. Um, it's, it's the exception, not the norm. Um, but still, even a big sale is a pretty big project. And it takes a, it takes a village of lawyers to get a deal done, uh, buy side or sell side. Now, um, earlier than that, um, I'll tell you, I, I grew up in North Dakota. Um, my parents were in the produce business. And um, it was a much different time uh, back then, I'll tell you that. Uh, and it was a much different place. And I went to school there. Uh, my early years, I went to the University of North Dakota so I could wrestle. I went on a wrestling scholarship. Uh, they were they were probably in the top three um, Division II universities, wrestling schools in the country at that time. Uh, Title line has changed that, but back then that was what I was about. That was everything, you know. I'm going to go where I get, you know, where I can wrestle. And uh, along the way, I got a degree in accounting. I'm a CPA. Got my CPA. Um, not a law degree. Uh, learned how to drink. Um, all those things you do in college. So that, and then I worked in Fargo, North Dakota, for four years. And uh, one day, and I remember getting out of school when I graduated. When I graduated, graduate college and law school, people kept saying, you know, you got the grades, you got the scores. You know, you you could get you could get a scholarship. You could go to any school in the country, and and I said, well, why would I do that? So well, then you could work anywhere in the country. And I remember saying many times, why would anyone ever want to leave North Dakota? I don't get that. <laughs> well, I mean, we got fishing, we got hunting. Winters are a little cold, but you know, I don't mind that. You know, um, and then after I'd actually got out of school, I actually visited New York City, and then I understood why people might want to leave. Um, so that's how I ended up in New York, getting an advanced degree and then sticking around on Wall Street and uh, doing doing those uh, wolf, wolves of Wall Street deals, we'll call them, because it was just like that. My clients made those guys look like choir boys. <laughs> well, what was the like? Um, what was the intention behind going into law or so? Oh, that thank you. you. Went into CPA or into the taxes. Or... Yeah, thanks. That's a big part uh, of my origin story, I guess. My dad, like I say, we were in a produce business. And I'm going to come back to that, by the way, because most of what I do is agriculture technology, because I grew up with that. All right. And I've returned to it. I've returned to my roots here. But with regard to law, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer since I was very, very young, because my dad was a small businessman. And what I noticed is that whenever there was a problem, a dispute, a regulatory issue, you know, a contract issue, or ever there was a problem, you had to call a lawyer. And the lawyers to me were like shamans in the village. They'd come in, you know, they'd examine a document, you know, and they'd bless it or not. Uh, they'd give you the solution, a cure for whatever the ailment was. Uh, they just seemed to be extremely powerful people through their knowledge. And it certainly was not the most lucrative thing I could have done. I mean, I put myself through school as an entrepreneur and I did a lot of, you know, stuff. I mean, I, I imported, <laughs> you know, I sold. Um, and even when I got out of school, I remember having to make that decision. You know, I could continue to stay in business and make a lot of money. But this law stuff is just so darned interesting. So you, you were working with your parents' produce company at the time? Uh, partly, but that no, mostly not. I mean, that was part of it. I mean, I, I did for a little bit, but I, I was doing my own stuff. I was doing this and that, as they say. <laughs> I, I imported goods from China and resold them throughout the Midwest and, and various other things. But it's, it's, it's honestly, it, it can be super easy to make a lot of money in this country if, if you really want to go for the low hanging fruit. But I just felt like, you know, this is just so much more intellectually interesting. And that's why I went into law. I, I was just drawn to the intellectual challenge of it. And I went into tax law because that was just the most puzzling of all of it. Um, and uh, that's where I stayed for a while. But yeah, so like I like I say, that that's how I got into law. That's and I stuck with it. And I knew my path from the time I was 12 
years old, I knew I would be accounting, CPA, attorney. I didn't know what an LLM was at that point, but I knew that would be what I would do. And I stayed with it consistently from day one. Uh, no real, the only variation is I'm here in Silicon Valley instead of back in Fargo, uh, but that's all right. Uh, I, I like it here. It's why I'm here. And uh, um, what was that transition like? So, because you, my understanding with with lawyers as well, like usually law firms, is that lawyers specialize in one area. But it seems like you started off in one, and then you you were interested in branching out or you, using that as a base towards like some other, you know, like startup or company law. Yeah. So, so my value proposition um, was, was after tax strategies, you know, I was really interested and it's still, even today, most of my clients are people who, who want to get the best after tax result. And in Silicon Valley, I mean, I have to fall on my sword a lot uh, because a lot of companies, they don't care about tax. Um, if they make a lot of money, if they have to pay tax, it means they made a lot of money and they should be happy. Um, but, you know, I do have a lot of tax sensitive investors, and that means foreigners for the most part, because they any tax they pay here, you know, is, you know, is voluntary. Right. There's lots of things a non-U.S. person can do, uh, not even non-U.S. You can be in Puerto Rico now and have a you know, five, six percent, four percent rate of tax, actually. Um, so tax sensitive. Second, pastors, a lot of angels. You know, they just hate paying more tax than they have to. So they're willing to do some more complex structures. And very, very few, if any, corporate lawyers have the appetite for working through that, especially with a startup, you know, because it's so risky. So that's, well, that was kind of my niche. I mean, I started out doing international tax, actually. Uh, I just decided if I was going to pick an area, I'd find the most difficult one. So that's what I did. Um, but then I got to Silicon Valley. I came to find out this valley is very international. Like everybody here is from someplace else. It's not just me. And then someplace else is off in other countries. Um, and then pass-throughs and just usual strategies for minimizing tax on exit, stuff like that. That that's, has always been my niche. Uh, but it got to be more of a 50-50 kind of thing, tax and corporate, because you know, I don't, I, what, what, what we used to say is don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Um, well, it, maybe not, but it's still going to be a pretty big tail. Uh, but someone has to take care of the dog too. So I, do, I started doing the corporate side as well. And I basically taught myself that. Um, and these days, uh, I just surround myself with a lot of people who are a lot smarter about corporate law than me. And as a team, we managed to, to get these deals done in the most effective way possible. So, so the other thing I mentioned was the produce angle. So you probably know about 10 or 12 years ago, um, I met the mayor of Salinas up at the Rosewood. We went up for drinks and uh, he was going on and on about this thing called Ag Tech. His name is Dennis Donahue. And just him telling me that, um, it just like just opened my eyes. I said, that makes so much sense. You know, here is an industry that totally needs to become tech enabled. Right. And um, and I'm familiar with agriculture tech. I've had those clients. My family's in that business. I know about refrigeration units. I know about irrigation and water running uphill and all this stuff. Um, but uh, it just it just dawned on me just how much more could be done, especially with data. And uh, so I started a, an ag tech group and my original vision uh, was to put the uh, the inventors together with the farmers, because what I found is the inventors were, were solving problems that didn't exist, right? You know, there are many of these really elegant solutions that were not practical. Um, you know, for example, uh, web-based um, field monitors for fields that had no broadband access. So it's like, well, you know, so anyway, I, uh, I, the original vision was to get a bunch of farmers and I actually was working with farmers. I'm one of the few lawyers probably here that actually has had farm clients just because I have a little bit of background in that. So I'd go down to Salinas and out to Fresno and Sacramento once in a while and visit these folks and talk to the county ag commissioner, et cetera. And I've been putting a lot of effort into that for the last 10 years. We do an annual conference. I've been all over the world speaking on the topic. Uh, we do events 
uh, this year. I'm hoping to, to do the first one in the Miami area ever. It's kind of surprising. I've been all over China, but I haven't done an event in Miami yet. And of course, we'll do our annual Silicon Valley Ag Tech Conference. But what happened is that it wasn't so much the farmers that showed up. I mean, we had to go to them, which we'd done. It was the investors that showed up. So that is squarely in my wheelhouse now. I got entrepreneurs here and investors here. Every day, people ask me to introduce them to investors. Well, now I've got them coming to my office saying, we want to see what you guys are doing with Ag Tech. I created an incubator. I had 15 companies that first year. Um, uh, the first year was the, the only year. After that, I said, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, but it was really fun, and it still has been. And it's great. We've launched some very, very big companies through our program. Uh, and my only interest in this is two things. Number one, as an enthusiast, you know, I'm interested in the space background in the space. I think there's a lot that can be done to improve the way we produce food and also now supply chain issues that, that we've all come to see more through what happened during COVID. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do than simply feed the world, which was our mandate uh, before in this country. Uh, now we can feed people in a healthy way, in a low cost way. Um, in a way that minimizes inputs, that's sustainable, that doesn't hurt the planet as much as it used to. So there's still a lot. There's still a lot there, but it was my frontier, and that's uh, that's how I got involved in that space so heavily, and that's what I do today. Yeah, well, the Silicon Valley Ag Tech. I, I believe the first year you ran it was 2012 or 13, something like that. Yeah. I'm I'm glad to hear that it's still running. Um, and and it, it definitely seems like a very underserved market because obviously, every, uh, you know, when in San Francisco, the the argument was, or being in the Bay, every, or let's say San Jose, people would argue that San Francisco gets all the attention. I'm sure even today, AgTech is considered pretty niche in most areas. You know, it's the it it is still the most successful venture sector, I think, even in this last downturn. I mean, we've been in a nuclear winter of venture capital investments, but AgTech has suffered less than others. And every year I say, I can't possibly keep growing at this rate. And every year it does. It's just, it's, I, I yeah, maybe it's niche, but um, uh, you're seeing climate tech investors in AgTech now because because agriculture technology is a big part of the solution to climate issues. You, know, you, you see people who are interested in health because food is medicine. You know, I firmly believe that. And Raj, you, you, you have some background in medical training, and I don't know if you ever had a nutrition class in your medical school, but we're coming around right now to the understanding that, you know, nutrition is really important. It's uh, wild, so Roger. Not one. Not one. Yeah. Not one uh, nutrition class. Yeah, and that's kind of shocking. Uh, maybe towards the end, I'll tell you, I've had some recent medical issues, and I just was just shocked at how little my doctors knew about nutrition. I was educating them, you know, on, on what people should and should not eat, et cetera. Because we can't, we, can't, we can't operate on a gut biome problem. We have to find something we can cut out. Yeah, you know, not to get up too far off on a tangent, but that's what I discovered that just, I just was so surprised. I thought, because I grew up in a rural area where the family doctor, you know, you had a lot of respect for that person. You kind of expected them to keep you well, uh, but that's not the way American medicine works. Doctors treat symptoms, say you, there's got to be something wrong with you, and then they fix it. Well, you know what? I think a better approach might be to let's see if we can stop that something wrong from happening. <laughs> you know, and I don't know why that is not the focus of our healthcare system. I just don't get it. It's so obvious. I have my conspiracy theories, of course, but uh, it seems to be that's where things are going. And that plays well into the health tech work that I do because I'm working with a lot of health tech companies that that is, is, you know, that's what they're focused on. That is their solution. Early detection, for example, nutrition, diagnostics, et cetera, you know, deal with these problems head on. It's Health in America is really declining. People don't they don't get that, but it is like it's, um, it's a virtual certainty that my generation is not going to live as long as my parents. I mean, my family, you know, 
my brothers and sisters and I are not going to attain the same age as my parents. Well, why is that? You know, and that's not just me. That's kind of a, it's kind of an American thing, but I digress. <clears throat> oh, uh, thank you. Um, I'd love to kind of switch modes into your own entrepreneurship story. Like, so you did briefly mention with Royce Law Firm, why you started it or, or the push you got to start it. But then because Royce Law Firm also in Silicon Valley has a very like kind of unique tradition. It's, it's a well-known firm, very niche, very boutique, but everywhere. So kind of talk to me about like the early days when it was just you, like what were some of the challenges that you felt as a solo uh, or not as a solo uh, lawyer, but, you know, as a as somebody who's balancing the entrepreneurship side, as well as your client side, who are just as demanding, while also building the firm out with the other pieces that you needed to support everything going on. And, and, and Roger, if we could, and Seth, I apologize. There was one last piece before we move on, because I'm I'm a huge fan of exactly what you're saying. And I think it's so apropos because you're speaking to two, I mean, candidly, you're, you're speaking to two immigrants. Um, back home, food scarcity is a massive problem. It is a mm -hmm. massive problem. My really, really close friend, Chris of the Zig, who harvest iponics, he's in Zambia understanding farm to table. He's doing like a digital farmer's market, connecting people because these preventative, you know, sides. Where did you see that growth and where did you see a lot of the friction points? Because we've been working with a lot of these ag tech guys and candidly every time, Roger, is most likely really heavy upfront capital that has to be patient capital because the majority of the time it was some sort of hardware move or something like that like can we move past this these friction points or do you see that because great we can do a vertical farm here we do i, I just see it so heavy on the uh, upfront patient capital side it's not as sexy boy you said a mouthful um <laughs> You definitely have to come to our conference. We cover all, you, you've just raised about 10 different issues that we have. Yeah. So the patient capital, let's start with that one. Uh, that's for sure. And that's what Silicon Valley, it took a while to figure out. VCs tend to be pretty impatient. They need their yep. money back pretty quickly. Well, agriculture is not like that. It takes a while. It takes a while to get into the market. It's going to take a while to get profitable. It's going to take a while just to, to build market share to where you're in a position to exit. It just takes a while. Um, secondly, this industry, it's a lot, you know, uh, um, when, when I did my first conferences, all our sponsors, they were tech companies, big, big Silicon Valley household name tech companies. And uh, one of them told me, I said, you know, I just don't be honest with you. I don't know why you're sponsoring us. <laughs> you had nothing to do with, hey, you're a software company. And they said, yeah, but this is our last frontier. We just haven't mm. cracked this nut yet. Um, so and that's and and that's a problem with agriculture. Generally, it's it it's it's uh, highly regulated, it's heavily subsidized, and it's competitive. It's a very tough business. Um, I think it's tougher than a lot of other businesses. So anyone who goes into service set industry really has to understand that. And I saw in the early days, I saw a lot of VCs getting involved in companies that they probably shouldn't have. I I still yeah. today. VCs will call me up and say, hey, what do you think of this company? And they would place bets that when they didn't really understand it, some of the board meetings are just comical. I mean, just, you know, the, those early board meetings, it's, oh, this is how you should market that. Just go set up a website and people will come to your, you know, and it, it's just a different industry. It just doesn't, just doesn't work that way. Uh, they're a lot smarter now. Of course, we have I've had lots of experience, but it, it is, it takes, it's a longer term to exit. No doubt about it. You got that. Uh, the flip side of that is that it's lucrative. There's a lot of room for innovation. It's really decentralized still. I mean, you've heard about the big players, of course, and vertical farming, et cetera. Nevertheless, I see so many new startups in ag tech. There's still lots and lots of new stuff out there. People are working to build. Private equity has recently gotten into the game and they're doing their, you know, roll-ups as they want to do and they're combining, you know, all these different pieces to the puzzle to create integrated solutions and um, that'll happen. It, it's happening now, but we're still, even 10 years later, it's still, I think, early days. There's still a lot of room. If somebody out there in your audience is looking to start a new company, this is a place where there is a need and there is a huge opportunity. Uh, there are a lot of problems to be solved, and there's a lot of areas where the space has just not yet been taken, right? Let me put it that way. 
Um, the other thing you said about where is the growth? Like you're, you're saying there's a food scarcity problem in parts of the world, and there is. And let, let me tell you a story about that. Uh, I don't know, five years ago or so, like I said, I've done this all over the world. I was invited to speak in um, Abu Dhabi at mm -hmm. an agriculture conference. And uh, and uh, it was actually pretty, pretty cool. You know, it was me standing next to a camel. Uh, <laughs> so, so I guess we looked alike. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I was... They put me there. But I remember I wanted to see uh, Dubai. So I drove from Abu Dhabi to Dubai and driving across the desert. Um, all of a sudden, out in the middle of nowhere, I would see like a, a vineyard pop up, small, but some sort of crop. And you look closely, you see wires and pipes, you know, and plastic. And it's like, that's egg tech, you know, that's grow local. They're, you know, they're, they're investing in it here. And in fact, in the development, I do a lot of work in Africa right now in AgTech. In the developing world, um, there's just tremendous investment going on in creating the means of production and doing it better. It's like, it's like skipping landlines and going to cell phones. That's what a lot of places are doing around uh, the developing world to, to combat this, this problem. Um, India has a huge food scarcity problem. The South, Southeast Asia, as a matter of fact, has a huge food, food scarcity problem, but there's lots of great tech coming out of there and being deployed there. So we're, we're definitely, in fact, that's probably where most of it is, Southeast Asia, now that I think about it. Um, and uh, just to, I guess, to drill down a little more on that, back during the Clinton years, uh, the World Bank would deal with food scarcity by just giving money away. Oh, here, here's some money, go buy a fish or whatever, or shipping products, shipping food. And that came to an end one day. The World Bank just stopped doing that one day and it left all these countries, you know, you know, saying, what are we going to do now? And the answer is we better start becoming self-sufficient. And vertical farming has a lot of promise that way. Uh, when I did my programs in Hong Kong, everybody that showed up was in vertical farming because they were urban farming. They wanted to grow, you know, their pineapples in Hong Kong, right? Now you could grow them in North Dakota if you wanted to. Um, and uh, when we were in Taiwan, it was all about aquatics, just trying to keep the fish healthy and safe and plentiful. So, so there's this, there's kind of a grow local idea, uh, which takes a lot of the friction out of the system because a lot of it is in shipping. Absolutely. You'll believe it, 40% of the food gets damaged or destroyed between farm to table because of shipping. Packaging, spoilage, damage, right? Those are those are big areas to be solved. And I can tell you, because my family was in that business, that it took a long time for just refrigeration technology to change. And it's changed very little in 50 years. I mean, there's there's cool stuff on the market now, but up until 10 years ago, there wasn't. So I bet you're sorry you asked. I mean, you get me started on this, I could go on and on and on. Yeah. It's just, I find it super interesting because, uh, you know, I'm talking with him right now. He's in, he's in Africa and he's realizing like, this is, this is a oh, wrong, man, I forget what I'm looking Sorry. This is like a real problem and and it's preventative and it's, it's not even just, you know, food scarce countries, it's water. It's, it's, it's just clean living sustainability. And, and, you know, we haven't trucked in when something's trucked in, it's owned by somebody. And when something's owned by something, there's an agenda in a third world country, you know, you bend over backwards and say, okay, how much do I have to pay this week? Yeah, it's right. And and for your for your startups, uh, so supply chain is part of it. But but think about this. Here's where the opportunities are. Number one, most basic production, right? How are we going to grow stuff out in the desert? You know, how yeah. are we going to eat water? And because we went through a drought here in California, I saw so much water tech. I saw solutions that would deliver exactly the precise minimum amount right to the root, and that let it all run off into the soil. Uh, I saw water substitutes, believe it or not. I Which I think is water. brilliant. Yeah. Water from air, water delivery, you know, efficient water delivery. So there's a million things. You know, there's a, there's now a proposal to, you know, there's big chunks of ice call, falling off the Arctic shelf. There's proposals to tow that to the desert areas. No, no. No, no. You no. know, and it's a real solution, you know. So so water is a big, and I have water companies in my practice. So So production, right? Production. Secondly, okay, now distribution, 
right? How are we going to get it to market? Here in America, we have a very complex system, especially in California. You got one party that owns the land, you got one party that farms the crop, you got another party that harvests the crop, you got another property party that ships it, another party that stores it, another party that distributes it. There's middle, middlemen all over the place, right? So if you eliminate the middlemen, you drive the price down. You know, part of the inflation problem I heard just on the radio this morning that uh, some of the really big food producers in this country are making record profits because of inflation and scarcity in America, right? So the profits are so high. It's like the old oil companies from many years ago that you know, a bunch of senators have jumped on the bandwagon and are complaining and they want accountability and why are you profiting from, you know, you know th these terrible things that are going on. Okay, well, look, I'll tell you one reason because there's a lot of inefficiency in the system, right? So production, distribution. So people who can solve supply chain problems and blockchain holds a lot of promise for that, by the way. I'll just tell you, and I've seen a lot of egg blockchain companies over the last five years and that's near to me. I taught a course in blockchain at Stanford Continuing Studies. So I, I think that's something. Um, and plus consumers like that. They like the, the traceability. They like provenance. They like knowing where their coffee beans came from, et cetera, stuff like that. And that they're slave labor free and all that. Um, and then in finance, right? I mean, how are we going to finance? Now, Africa, you mentioned Africa, and that's why I raise this example you know, or any place like that. It's pretty hard for a farmer to get financing to buy the seed, the fertilizer, grow the crop, take it to market. Well, you know what? Uh, a, a smart software guy can solve that problem, right? Especially with you've got good data and you know uh, just how well that crop's doing. Uh, and if you can put it on a blockchain, uh, you know, that's just one example of ways that you can get financing to the farmer and just smart contracts can automatically execute and pay the, the, the lenders and financiers. And it, in Africa, it even goes beyond that. It's like keeping shelf stock, right? So you're the grocer, you don't have the money to buy the products that your people need, right? Well, you know, solve that little itsy bitty problem and just look how much better you're gonna make, you, you know, things for everybody in the chain. Anyway. <laughs> No, that, yeah. that, that was a really good kind of tangent because so uh, my firm in Pakistan used to work very closely with USAID, with uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because a lot of these were the only, call them public, private, subsidized, like um, just finances and support for the little guy who's already working beneath, below the poverty line in a part of the country which isn't very accessible. There are all these, you know, they have to deal with their land owners, they have to deal with the local mafias and stuff. And it's already uh, an industry that is already squeezed so tightly that without these kinds of subsidies and, and without this third party support, they would never be able to modernize or or kind of become more efficient. So a lot of parallels between the, the African and the uh, Pakistani uh, side of uh, needs yeah, absolutely well we're gonna see you know um we're gonna see just big revel and we've seen that before we've seen revolutions in agriculture before uh right but i mean after world war ii our objective was again to feed the world which you know and now wheat looks a lot different now than it did before world war ii and we've done that but it's maybe not the healthiest thing for you so now we get another revolution of of um of a different way to feed the world uh is just there's just so much going on and so much changing. You know, one other thing I want to pause on is um, uh, water. You mentioned water, and it's easy to forget because our reservoirs are mostly full now after the the year we've had here in California. Um, but we're going to go back into drought again. I mean, this is a desert. That's what happens in California. You know, we do hit dr droughts, and and a lot of our water goes to to. Uh, wild rivers and etc. So there's other demands on water, um, but this is going to be another one of the defining problems in agriculture. Uh, one of the things that people don't pay enough attention to, uh, well, two things in agriculture. Here's my prediction from having been doing this now for 10 years. Number one, water. The Algalala Reservoir is running dry out in the Midwest where I grew up, <clears throat> um, and uh, that's going to be a major problem for ag unless 
all of agriculture, including the row crops out in the Midwest and the commodity crops start to figure out how to more efficiently use water. So that's something that, um, you know, that really has to be addressed and companies are doing it. Uh, but, you know, but the time to, what do they say? The time to paint your house is when the sun is shining or whatever the metaphor is, the time to deal with it is now. Secondly, is just the, the, the pollution, the impact on the environment. You know, I grew, I remember when I was going to college uh, in Grand Forks along the Red River, Red River, I'd go down fishing near Fargo. I'd go fishing uh, on weekends and I'd have, to, I'd have to call fish and game and ask them if the fish were safe to eat because there's so many nitrates from agricultural runoff, right? And most of that goes south, the Red River goes north. So Canada got our problem. But uh, the Mississippi goes south, dumps in to the Gulf of Mexico, where you will find this huge dead zone. It's a dead zone. Nothing can, you know, for hundreds of square miles, nothing can live because there's, you know, so many nitrates in the water. Uh, tech can easily solve that problem, and it is doing so. Uh, and then, of course, climate. And we hear a lot about carbon and carbon sequestration. Well, you can do a lot of that just through egg solutions. Uh, as companies are working on. But there's a million things we could talk about in that space. And I know you get other things you'd like to cover. So I will leave that alone for now. <laughs> no, that was a, that was really good. That That's basically a masterclass in ag tech uh, for our viewers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so sorry to to be the bearer of bad news and, and kind of bring the energy a little different. But I, I do, I am personally interested uh, uh, about the not only the Royce Law Firm story from your perspective as again somebody who's working at such a high level with or with and for your clients, but then also having to deal with all the other stuff that comes about having to build a company, regardless if it's a law firm or something else. And I'd love to touch on that story for a bit. Yeah. So you knew me when I was Royce Law Firm three years ago. We joined Haynes and Boone. So I'm now with Haynes and Boone. Texas-based law firm offices all over the country and the world, in fact. Uh, and I am here in Palo Alto still, Silicon Valley, doing the same thing, servicing the same clients, but uh, flying that flag, uh, so you know. Um, yeah, so what we do is formation, financing, commercial contracts, and M&A, uh, but we do it Silicon Valley style. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we do it efficiently. Right. And it's it's a different style of practice here. I practice in New York City. I practice in the Midwest. You know, I've done motion picture entertainment industry stuff. Thank God I don't have to do that again. Um, I've done oil companies, you know, I've done a, I've done a lot of different things, but now uh, this is really a different kettle of fish. Um, <clears throat> now, part of what I do, I've got two books out. The first one is called Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. It's a little dated now. It's about 10 years old. Uh, people still reference it. You probably have it on your shelf. I have it over here somewhere. <laughs> I'll have to look for it. <laughs> you know, what I don't know is if you've got my latest book called 10,000 Startups. If not, uh, I'll send it to you. Uh, and the, the Dead on Arrival was about all the mistakes people make. Because in all those industries I just described that I've been involved in, People make the same stupid mistakes over and over. It's just the same avoidable legal mistakes they could easily, you know, have dealt with if they had just a little bit of, you know, prior warning. Uh, 10,000 Startups is different. That's more of a story about successes. All the stuff you don't hear about because it didn't go wrong, right? All right? The, the founders that actually got along because they got their equity split right. Um, the, uh, the IP that... You didn't have 10 people claiming because they got the ownership right. Uh, the, uh, the employees that didn't sue the company because we got the contracts right. All the stuff that went right. That's 10,000 startups. It's stories about what to do right and uh, stories about companies that have had good, successful, and avoided, you know, tragedy averted, uh, uh, that avoided big problems that could have happened. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what you did during COVID. I wrote a book. Um, we were all stuck at home, uh, day drinking. So I decided instead I'd spend the time uh, writing. And the book came out about a year ago. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing more about it. Uh, and, you'll, and I'll certainly be creating some content around it. But it describes what I do. Formation, financing, exit. 
that's the corporate, it's tax planning, that's dealing with the employment issues, which is a huge issue here in California. I'll tell you that. It's so counterintuitive. People from out of state are just always shocked and surprised to learn what California law provides. Intellectual property, my clients are tech companies. IP is super important. We better get that ownership right. Um, what else? Um, probably these days, privacy infects almost every company. You got to deal with privacy if you've got a website, an interactive website. Um, and then I try to go a little bit beyond that into sort, sort of more of the practical issues, like how do the founders divide up their ownership, right? You know, and 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 what should our our IP strategy be? Should we patent it or should we rely on trade secret? And if we are going to rely on trade secret, how do we make sure that it's really a secret, right? <laughs> so how do we protect it? So that's what the book's about, and that's that's what I do all day every day. Awesome. Tell us a little more about like the the Haynes Boone transition, because like going from uh, your own outfit to now this behemoth that you're partner at and yeah. have all the, uh, have access to all these new toys that you can kind of live. Yeah, no, it, it, it's been awesome. We are an AMLA 100 law firm. Um, to my clients, I don't think they've really noticed a difference. They're still getting me uh, and my team and I'm still doing the same thing. Uh, the only difference is, is that when they do hit that point, when, when they can do an exit or they need you know, we've got a Cal OSHA expert in our firm. I mean, I never had access to that before. We've got international trade lawyers. You know, it's a, these days it's really tough, you know, to do international trade, to have foreign investors in your company, especially if they're from China. Well, we got a China office. We've got people that know that. So we've got all this stuff that we can handle in-house now, uh, especially as they get bigger and, and, and have much bigger needs and have to protect the asset that they've built. So it, it's been great that way because I can stay with my clients uh, longer in the process. Uh, although uh, I, I do have to rely on other people who have different areas of expertise when we get there. I'm not gonna do public company work. It's a little too late in the game for me to start that now, um, but I can sure as heck position that company for when they do go public and we got the people right down the hall that can make that a smooth process. So yeah, it's 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 worked out. It's worked out really well. Well, let's let's uh, spend the last or the next. Uh, we have about forty five minutes or so uh, for the episode, but I'd love to deep dive into how you prefer working with founders and and startups. So because I I know for a fact that you work even pre idea in many cases. But... Yeah, I want to get in early. I mean, I'm as much of a VC as my VC clients. You know, I'm betting on them. I'm betting on these companies. If I don't pick winners, you know, I'm not going to be in business very long. So I like to get in really early uh, and really understand the company and do everything I can to help them, whether that's legal or or uh, or just being here to, to talk about some other issues or putting them in touch with other professionals that can advise them on, on where their blind spots are. So, um, so I get in early and uh, stay with them. And early means formation. It's so easy to go do it yourself. And um, my view of do-it-yourself websites, um, first of all, I always have to redo all the work, but it's, it's okay. Usually it's nothing that can't be fixed. Uh, but um, unlike other lawyers, I'm just really happy to see do-it-yourself legal websites out there because they kind of weed out the tourists. And that's, you know, it's less, if someone's not willing to, a couple thousand dollars on themselves by having an incorporation done right. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to be that committed to that company either. So it, it, it helps me with my due diligence. Um, and um, But even if they do get lucky or if they manage to start someplace else and come to me, it's okay. You know, we can take them to that next level pretty quickly. Give them a, those good, solid legal bones and using processes that it's taken me 30 or 40 years to develop. Um, and that's, I mean, I've got a system and I got a process and we can make it efficient. And it's uh, might not be quite uh, Six Sigma, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, we have a very lean process here, let me put it that way. And as somebody who's seen so many 
not only mistakes, but then also like how people from the very earliest days have made decisions that have helped support their success later on. Can you point out like some of those stupid kind of mistakes that people knowingly or unknowingly entrepreneurs are making Seth, before was, engaging somebody like you? <laughs> I was going to say mistakes. I'm like, Roger, like we're new founders and you're coming at formation and the first thing, like 10 out of 11 out of 10 times you say like, okay, I got to go raise money. And you're like, hold on, hold on. Like where, where do, where do you see just this? And especially the transition from a 30 person to a, a Haynes Boone from Dallas. Like what were the trials and tribulations? Do you see the same kind of like, doesn't matter if you're with a big boys now founder, what are you doing? <laughs> like, do you see kind of these common mistakes? We just want to, you just like, it really like, and then you wrote a book about it type thing. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, read my book. You know, it's funny. I, <laughs> the the book is is based on um, on presentations I used to give, and uh, when I first started out, so I put together a presentation saying, "Oh, legal issues for startups." And I go promote it, and four people would show up. And then I said, "Well, okay, need some better branding." So it'd be uh, top legal issue startup founders should think about, and you know, six people would show up. And one day I said you know, legal mistakes that will kill your company. And like hundreds of people are starting to show up to want to hear this, like what what's going to kill my company? So let me tell you, the number one, the number one dead on arrival issue um, is lack of documentation. And I've seen it over, and by the way, I've been a startup founder. I, mean, I started a, a clean tech company 20 years ago in geothermal. So I understand that hesitation to put paper in place when you get your three or four or five partners, to, you know, whatever it is, usually two, but you get them together, uh, but that's a killer, right? My book talks a lot about it. Both of them do, because that's just number one. You got to get something in writing. It's surprising how little you need, but you got to have something. Uh, otherwise, you're just at the mercy of people's recollections or expectations. Uh, that's number one. Uh, the, the second place where people mess up out here is everybody's got a side hustle. Their job, their startup starts as uh, nights and weekend kind of thing. We'll make darn sure it's nights and weekend because otherwise you get a prior employer who's going to own your company or at least a big part of it or maybe be, we'll kill it. That's another dead on arrival issue. You know, and beyond that, I mean, there's a few others, but most mistakes people make we can fix just cost money or cost valuation. But those are the two like like really big ones. I guess the third thing I say is getting your equity, equity split wrong, but we can fix that. Right, we because yeah, you're going to adjust equity at every funding round, and it takes at least ten years to get from start to finish these days. Uh, didn't used to be like that. By the way, you know that's why vesting schedules are all four years now. It used to take four years to get from start to IPO. Um, did you? you know. wow. And Roger, can you speak to that? I did have a question because we've had a lot of this, and and Seth and I are actually right in the th the thick of it. To be candid, we have a lot of people on the startup studio side looking. Hey, listen, here we're here. We had term sheets that got pulled that were signed. We had cursory docs here, here. Yeah. I had a guy yesterday, you know, and he's talking about, um, and, and and now I'm sure you know, Roger, people are just kind of grasping at straws. Um, we're lucky we, we're raising on a profitable business. You know, we're not raising to get profitable. But a lot of people are saying now, okay, here, if we've, we've had X amount of the raise committed. I have somebody else looking. They're asking if the terms are across the round are the same. And I'm like, well, yeah, how would they not be? They're like, well, can I can I sweeten it with this, this, and this? I'm like, do you already have other checks at these terms? Like, well, yeah, but I'm like, listen, I'm not I'm not a lawyer, but like just be very cognizant of I, I understand things are tough right now, but be very cognizant of what you're doing, who you're alienating, how the how the dilution is. I mean, this is a really this is really going on right now, as we've seen it. Yeah. Well, the, the moral of that story is that's where you need a Please. lawyer. You know, yes. that's what you need a lawyer. You raised that you set a mouthful there. You raised a lot of issues. There's fiduciary issues, there's disclosure issues. There's I just kind of come in, Roger, to like throw a bomb and I walk out. <laughs> yeah. But but the, the bomb is that it's so easy now to just go online and download investment documents and go mess your company up. I see that yes. all the time. Yes. And, uh, and you have to argue with people about the documents. Well, gee, it's the Y combinator. It's the Y C C Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's that's a problem, you know. <laughs> That's so, the problem. Yeah. So uh, th there are things that people can do themselves, and there are places where you need a lawyer. And my book talks about that. And selling securities, which you're doing. If you're taking money, you're selling a security. And you might think that's pretty harmless because everybody does it. It's just so easy. Well, I can introduce you to people sitting in jail who mess that up. 
you know, because they didn't have a lawyer. They thought it was just so easy. They do it themselves and they messed it up. And you might think, well, they must be bad people. I took the money and, yeah. you know, Bahamas. No, they weren't. They didn't they know. Weren't. They had no they idea. No, they made innocent mistakes. I know both. There's two two guys in particular I'm thinking about that. Um, one of them, even though he's a software guy, he was just really bad at math. So he did the Bugsy Siegel you know, Sands Casino thing and sold his company more than once uh, to various investors. He didn't try to do that. He was just super bad at record keeping. He didn't realize that. Wow. Well, that is securities fraud and it landed him in jail. I mean, his career's kind of over. Uh, I know somebody else who just didn't disclose everything he was supposed to disclose. He didn't think it was important. Look at the lawsuits going on now. Theranos, you know, everybody talks about how terrible that was with Ms. Holmes did. And the bad part is that it's in the medical field, but companies were doing that and probably still are all the time. They're puffing and puffing and puffing so much that all, all of a sudden, oops, we've crossed over that line from puffing to making fraudulent statements that are going to get me sued. And those founders all day long, they're in their echo chamber, like, okay, I'm going to revolution. I, I got to sell the story. I got to sell the story. Okay. Maybe I'll add one last piece that I'm, you know, Icarus. And you're like, hold on. What, what are you? Yeah. So yeah. It, you, you believe yeah. yourself. I, and it's funny because I grew up with Elizabeth. We went to the same school. We were close friends. Oh, <laughs> we were at some of the first. We were at UBS. I had some guys putting her first dollars, first checks. She's an ama- She's a good person. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. You know, I, I'm. I get a little bit of criticism because I'm a defender of hers because uh, I. I look at what she's doing. I'm saying, I think she really believed. Absolutely. Knowing. And I think she felt like she could just puff a little bit and uh, she was going to solve that problem because, because by the way, look what's going on in liquid biopsies now out there. I mean, it's incredible stuff. What she was doing doesn't sound all that space agey when you look at what's on the market, stuff I personally use that I'd like to talk a little bit about if we have the time later. But um, so, but the, the moral of the story is, is that when people start losing a lot of money, the courts are going to take a much different view and we got to just be super careful. You know, where it usually comes up, the, the Liz Holmes, that, that's kind of a, like I say, it's its own little world because it's medical. But how it usually comes up is somebody will, will overstate what their revenue pipeline looks like. And there's a point where you can say, yeah, you know, we're doing really great. We got interest from all the, you know, all the big Silicon Valley companies. That's okay. Then they'll say, we got orders. You have orders, you have signed purchase orders. Well, not exactly, but you know, we had these calls and and they said they'd buy something. Well, not exactly, but they're really interested. We know they're going to. Well, you know what? You've just crossed that line. You said you had orders. That's a factual misstatement. But I think startup founders, like you say, they're in their echo chamber and they blur that difference. A lot of them also, uh, there's there's this pressure, right? That if nothing's working, all right, let's make some noise. Let's kind of throw it out in the ether and see if we can either make something stick or if somebody who is part of that audience that we're trying to target, hears what we're doing and then comes back to us. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of the same even with fundraising. Like um, I've had to tell so many, and, and I didn't know about this until actually Roger told me about 10 years ago that, hey, you cannot go online and actively solicit funds. Or you can't say like, hey, we're raising this. Anybody know of anybody, uh, anybody who could help? Like that is a, is a big no-no with the SEC. And, well, and can, you, and can you sit on that one, Roger? Because that's come pervasively from every direction. And candidly, I'm not the smartest guy. Look at me. But... What am I missing here? If I'm if I'm a generic person saying this is what we're doing, I mean, I'm maybe not taking I, I'm not doing the KYC on accredited investors, but I'm not taking money through that that medium through that channel. I'm just literally awareness. Like where what am I missing? Because I think what Seth said is so many founders we talked to are just like, but we're doing this. I'm like, that's the problem. You can't literally go online and do that. And it's it, like they're taking websites down. I just think it's it's interesting because I actually yeah. couldn't wrap my pea brain around it. Yeah, it, it's it's complicated securities law. So okay. let, let me just tell you that as of uh, in 2012, the law did change so that there is a securities law exemption, 506C, where you can advertise, you can solicit, you can skywrite, you can go through the phone book and call people. Uh, but if you want to use that exemption, you have to meet a whole another set of requirements. Okay. 
big one is is verification, which is the facts and circumstances. You got to verify that your investors, investors, all of them are accredited. Get one unaccredited and you blow the exemption. That's where people mess that up. But usually it's on the verification and they don't even bother trying because they don't know. They just know that their buddy did this and so it must be okay. So there is a way to do that. It's just got to be done right. Uh, the second thing that you touched on is all the crowdfunding sites. And there are good ones. I do a lot of crowdfunding deals. That's a, that's where, a way you can sell securities through a platform. Um, and I do a lot of deals that way. And I, I, I've seen it work. I've seen it work well. None of us thought it would in 2012 when we got that law, but it has. And partly because the exemptions have gone up, it's loosened up a little. You can test the waters. You can do a lot of stuff that you couldn't do before. So I'm a believer in it. I like it. I think it's a source of funding for founders, but it's got to be done right. And you got to be on the right sites. Uh, you don't want to be in a market for lemons. And you don't want to be in a site that's constantly in trouble with the SEC. Um, and and yeah, that, that, we know who they are. Let me just put it that way. You know who the reputable ones are. You know who's, who's not. Um, so you just got to be careful about that because selling securities that way is a big marketing thing. Right. You're out there. Everyone knows. Everyone can see. You better be successful at it <laughs> if you're going to go that route. And I could talk about crowdfunding for a long time, but I won't. <laughs> but but the big picture, because I think a lot of founders, especially right now, where capital markets are, they're looking that way. And there's a stigma. Um, I'll be honest, Roger, like I... I won't reference that, but even our legal representation was like, we don't touch any, we, we literally won't represent a company doing any reggae or, or, and I'm like, or any crash CF, like what they don't, they don't want to touch it. I'm like, I get it might be a little bit more complicated, but that, that's the, that's the, that's, that's it. They're like, that's it. I was like, oh, oh yeah, okay. Well, I, I will, I'll, I'll just warn you reggae plus, I think is what you're referring to has become a more complex, expensive exemption than people thought it would be. So, uh, but, but uh, I'm not afraid of any of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wonder. Hey, uh, with the time we've got, um, I'm going to give you something here. Maybe you'll use it. Maybe you won't. Um, but especially, Rod, since you got a medical background, um, a year ago in July, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, and uh, so I had six months of chemo and a pretty major surgery uh, in November. They took all or part of four of my internal organs out of me. So uh I'm back on the mend. I lost all my hair, but it's growing back. Um, I'm working out a lot, you know, and trying to, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've got some neuropathy and stuff. But, so there's some lingering side effects. Um, but um, I recently, this is such a Silicon Valley thing. Um, I, uh, I had, I've had the last eight or nine months to really read a lot of science papers and to really drill down and to really understand the system. These medical standard of care, hospitals, the insurance industry, the FDA, and big pharma. And I am approaching this problem in a Silicon Valley style. Mm -hmm. And I've had doctors now tell me, and especially now I've got a pathology report and a biomarker report, they tell me that my particular brand of cancer is uniformly fatal and there is no cure and it's just a matter of time. And uh, I'll probably see this Christmas, but maybe not the next one. That's what doctors tell me. But I've had three scientists tell me not so fast, right? Um, so in a couple of weeks, I'm on a plane to another country. Get this. I got to go to another country to get a cancer vaccine that's yep. manufactured in this country. Yep. And get it here. I can get it there. And uh, I'll be there. Uh, it, it's going to be about a year of, of back and forth on this. Uh, so I'm working full time. So it's it's just this is my new hobby. Um, but I, I look out out there and I met so many cancer patients, so many, because that was my, I just went and talked, when I got diagnosed, I went and talked to all the survivors and I said, what did you do? You know, you're still around and you shouldn't be, you know, what did you do? And I kind of picked up on what they did. And like I say, it's, if this is an area that I can't think of an area, I'm big on food and egg, but I can't think of an area that needs more disruption than our healthcare system and an area that's more ripe for innovation. And the science is out there. For me to find this vaccine, I, you know, people say, wow, that you found the exact thing. I had a scientist, last week I talked to three scientists and they said, 
you found the exact thing for your exact mutation, your oncogene. How did you find that? It's like a needle in a haystack. No, it was like a needle in a stack of needles. You know, I found it through nine months of, of putting tremendous amounts of effort into this. So, you know, I, uh, I, I would really be interested because healthcare, we, we could solve so many problems. We could solve me, so many problems in this country. You know, the problem is, you know, the answer, Roger, you do. And I hate to say, it, you know, the answer. I know the answer. Everybody listening knows the answer. Seth knows the answer. I went in five physicians, uh, hematology, oncology, peds, neuro IR for my dad, neuro IR for my brother, um, derm pad for my sister, uh, my mom. I went in with, candidly, you know, brother, like I went into the ER with pancreatitis. And that's how mine started. My triglycerides were 1300. They're like, cool, take your gem fibers. Blah, 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 blah. Like, actually, I should have stopped drinking the bottle of alcohol every single day. That's oh, yeah. what I should have. That's what I should have done. And until I, I went to somebody to be like, actually, you're trying glycerizing your fatty liver enzymes are at this because of that. I'm like, like the explanation is like, what the? And and it's it's my family, and and you know, Seth knows, but that's honestly why I started the company that we're doing now. Um, we're a digital health company, um, and basically, for me, it's reactive medicine. Western medicine is reactive medicine. Preventative medicine isn't lucrative enough. It's not lucrative enough stick it to a healthy habit take the ding dong out of your mouth and so thrive health it's gonna you know we're starting basically sticking rogers to his his healthy habit through a personality matching the myers brig for your personal trainer your wellness provider we've seen an efficacy model of 300 percent of sticking to a healthy habit and then it, it begets the one next thing of what is tesla know? well elon knows hey roger you don't speed you use your blinker you don't get in wrecks you're a good driver we're going to insure you at a lower premium Hey, Roger, you've been on our platform. Your, your bookings are going up. Your BMI is going down. You've been more healthy in your, your healthy habit. We're going to insure you at a lower premium. We're the first platform that can take HSA and FSA monies. We're part of the Silver Sneaker programs because we just don't want the recidivism of going to the ER. Like, enough. I understand I'm going to piss off Pfizer. I'm going to piss off all. Fine. Fine. And why? So you could then probably be called un-American for going to a different country to get treatment. You know what I mean? I got no choice, right? And yeah. that's, what does that even mean, Roger? What does I mean, that mean? That means that the the, the, the FDA, you know, the, 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 they've given me no choice. I know. And they've given me no choice. I can get CE through. mark in Europe. It's, it, they, they blaspheme it here. And I'm like, what, like, who are we? Yeah. And uh, it's surprisingly effective what I'm about to do. And it's just, I just, you know, it's just kind of crazy that the system's like this, but what you said about prevention. Yeah. My, my doctors like uh, the alcohol, let's start with that. I asked him, he said, yeah, you can have two drinks a day, two drinks a day. I didn't drink that much even before I got cancer. I mean, two drink, you let your patients have two drinks a day, you know, and what, what should I eat? So you can eat whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Really? I can have a Coca-Cola or shit? Yeah, like, <laughs> have your hamburgers. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of it. You're like, no, that's not what I, what? Well, not, now you know why 90% of the people in this country who have what I have don't live five years. I mean, if that's the advice they're getting, I mean, jeez. And then, then the detection could have been way earlier, you know? Fortunately, we caught it in time, so it's curable for me with a little bit of help from my friends, but... Um, you know, if we'd have caught a little bit earlier, I wouldn't even have to go to these measures. So there's just so much wrong with the system. Um, uh, but we could talk for hours about that. Yeah, we could. And and one thing I also want to point out is that, so Roger, you've been, you've led a healthy-ish lifestyle all your life, or at least from what I've seen on the outside. The only maybe, um, you know, the kind of triggering point is, you know, like, the alcohol maybe but i've never even seen you as an alcoholic like you're uh, from north dakota everybody from you know <laughs> that area or even over here like come on a couple of drinks here and there or you know um uh a uh you know a, a bender you know once in a while is normal but for somebody who i know you're you're you love biking i know you're you're an outdoor person i um i know you you yeah. take efforts to maintain a healthy-ish lifestyle despite all of that like what were some other changes in your opinion that you need to make 
Oh, yeah, let, let me stop. I, I mean, I didn't. I, I, I go to a lot of events. I, I would really. I might have two drinks a week. I mean, I was not a big drinker. Uh, I was having a can of Coca Cola a day. I come to learn that's not good for anybody. Uh, I hope they're not one of your sponsors. But uh, I've had to, you know, I've, I've cut my sugar way back as much as I can. But even before this, I was. I had a plant based whole food diet. I exercised every day. I had a mindfulness practice. I thought I was doing everything right. Uh, I would say contributing factors were probably stress. I'm in a pretty high stress job, no doubt about it. Um, I didn't get enough sleep. That's for sure. I just didn't think sleep was important. I know better now. Um, I've, and I've learned just last week, I did a DEXA scan and uh, I've learned that my visceral body fat, even though I'm lean, I'm lean for a 25 year old, but my visceral body fat's a little higher than they'd like it to be. So I'm sure three years ago or whenever this started to grow is probably a lot higher. So I, I've been, you know, but, but a lot, all this is lifestyle, right? It's all lifestyle. You know, we could prevent so much disease in this country if people knew this ahead of time. It's, I mean, can, can you kind of elaborate on that? Like, what did the FDA actually use as, as the reason for not being able to use it? Yeah, so the way, so, so we've got sort of a, a complex, we'll call it a medical government uh, business complex in the U.S. when it comes to, to medical care. Uh, and it's really four things. It's, it's first of all, the major cancer institutions, and uh, I'm being advised by two of the biggest and best in this space, in pancreatic cancer, um, they are bound by something called standard of care. And you hear the word standard of care and they use it in a very positive way, like it's a good thing. Uh, I've come to realize that it's a bad thing because standard of care for what I have in the US ends in death. Standard of care is chemo, radiation, surgery, then death. Okay, not very satisfying to me, not a solution that I think I'm gonna just settle on. Um, and, and why is that? Well, I, I think there's a very dominant influence by the insurance industry, right? Because doctors in this country are trained in whatever insurance companies will cover. They're not trained in what insurance companies don't cover. I'm not saying there's any bad motive that went into that. I'm just saying that's how it's kind of worked out. So they don't even know about some of these other therapies that might be life-saving for a lot of people. And then secondly, even no one will admit it, I think they are a little, I think part of it is my profession's fault. I think they're a little litigation averse. If you go out on a limb and do something that someone else hasn't done before and it doesn't go well, well, you could be subject to criticism. So, so we've got a very conservative medical establishment. Secondly, we've got an FDA that makes no sense to me at all. I mean, if there's an evil player in any of this, it's them. And my doctor says, look, the FDA is not conspiring to kill you. They might not be conspiring to kill me, but they sure don't give a rat's ass whether I live or not. That's obvious, right? For example, there's things called off-label drugs. So I happen to have a condition that there's an off-label drug. There's a, there's a therapy that's prescribed regularly as standard of care for lung cancer, uh, but it turns out it works great for my particular mutation in pancreatic cancer, but it's off-label, right? So, so it means the FDA has not approved it for my use, which means I've got to jump through a whole bunch more hoops and find a doctor who's willing to give that to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll find them um, here, even here in the US, but they're taking a risk because now they're beyond standard of care. Um, the biggest thing, it just takes forever to get a therapy to market here. And I've talked to so many cancer uh, companies that are developing cancer therapies. I put together a big Google doc of all of them. There's so much of it. And I say, that's awesome. You have boron radiation therapy. That's awesome. The tech is amazing. How can I get this? And it's like, well, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, after the FDA approves it, you know, it'll be commercially available. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. No further questions. Now there is an FDA process, um, uh, ironically called compassionate use. Uh, or expanded access, where if you're you got no other options available to you, they you know you apply and then they'll let you try something new and experimental. Um, so I've been in the, the compassionate use process with FDA for several months now, and I think what 
I think, I suspect, I can't prove, but I think what usually happens is that application sits on bureau, some bureaucrat's, bureaucrat's desk until the patient dies and nobody ever has to hold him accountable. There's another process that I found where you can force the FDA to act. In other words, you know, you've got 30 days to act. If you don't, then I'm automatically approved to use it. Problem is I still have to meet a couple other hurdles that requires FDA discretion. Uh, for example, there's no other therapies available, you know, et cetera. And I'm, I can't say that just yet. I'm not, the, the way the system's set up is you have to be so far advanced in your cancer that you're probably beyond cure before you can get the therapy that would have saved you if you'd gotten it a year earlier. That's the way the system's set up. Big pharma is not helpful. Um, I'll give you an example. The therapy I'm talking about is called a neoantigen peptide vaccine. One of the very big, big pharma companies here in the San Francisco Bay Area was developing this vaccine, but then they dropped it, right? They dropped it. Why did they drop it? Well, the NIH pulled its funding. And so they said, we're not going to take the risk on this without funding. Well, the cynical side of me has another reason. Um, I've spent probably, I probably had, you know, almost hundreds of thousands, maybe a million dollars worth of chemotherapy now. This neoantigen peptide vaccine is going to cost a small fraction of that. If you're the big company developing the therapy, I mean, what are you going to do? Where are the economic incentives? The incentives are to do what's most profitable, not, not what's best for the patient, right? I mean, you got chemotherapy. The chemotherapy I got is all old. There's nothing new. It's all old. It's old technology. And it's terrible. It is truly awful. My oncologist apologized to me right from the start. He says, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to you. And it was worse than anything I ever imagined. Uh, I won't do that again. And by the way, very few people make it all the way through six months of my chemo. Uh, they either die or they show disease progression. Um, or a lot of times they just say, forget it. I'll take the alternative. I'm not doing that. And I came pretty close myself to that last category. You know, towards the end, it's like, I don't know if I want to go do this again. So it's, you know, chemo is, I hope it's not a long-term solution. And then finally, the, the insurance companies, and they only cover things that the FDA approves. And uh, again, um, I'm, I'm not saying insurance companies are evil or, at all. They're a business, right? They're a profit-making business. But look where the incentives are. I'm not a very good bet for them. The sooner I die, the better it is for the insurance company. For me to go get a therapy that's going to extend my life, that just extends the amount of time that maybe I'll come across something the FDA will let me have and they have to pay for. So the incentives are all wrong, right? You know, it, That's why I say it's an area ripe for disruption. And it'd be great if we could do that here in the U.S. It's a practical matter. I've met so many cancer, cancer patients, and a lot of them, they stay alive until they run out of money. You know, that's how it works. And uh, that's and that could very well be me because there's other therapy. If this doesn't work, by the way, I got backup plans on top of backup plans. I'm in Silicon Valley. I've got access to stuff that normal people just don't just from being here and knowing these companies. But it's expensive and companies don't like giving it to you. They'd much rather you go through a clinical trial and approve the drug so that they can make billions on it rather than take a couple hundred thousand dollars from me to, so I can get treatment. I mean, that's that just, you know, it takes up their resources. It's, it's just not something they're interested in doing. Um, and you only get in if you know somebody, right? So, well, I know people. So I'm going to get these therapies. Uh, you know, again, I got backup plans on top of backup plans, but it could end up being like super expensive. And I just hope that someday in my lifetime, I'll see a system that makes sense, right? First of all, that is preventative, that teaches people a little bit about exercise and nutrition. So, and stress, you know, and limit and, and early detection would be the second thing. Let's get this stuff when it's easily treatable. And then fourthly, uh, a, a modern age therapy that isn't like a medieval torture chamber of free people. And what I mean are vaccines and immunotherapies. Uh, so that's what I wanna see happen in cancer. By the way, you know, cancer uh, cure rates have not gone up. I mean, you're going to hear people say they have. They really haven't. You look at the charts. I mean, we haven't made much progress at all. All we've done is we've caught it earlier through early detection, right? But 
the cures, I mean, they don't, chemo doesn't work any better today than it did 20 years ago or 10 years ago for, my, you know, for some of them. So that's the end of my rant. Well, um, no, hey, Roger, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And we wish you all the very best in uh, the treatment. I'm very, very happy to see you staying positive and still your, your upbeat self through all of this and, and despite all of this. And um, but, you know we're we're praying for your recovery, and uh, when you get back, uh, from the, the your trips, um, yeah, we're we're gonna be here for you every step of the way. So. Great. Well, thanks. It was great talking with you. It's good to see you again. Um, uh, this is really cool. Uh, you know, you use whatever from this that you think is valuable. Uh, so no, I've, I, I, I'm uh, the only part I'm probably gonna end up having to cut out is the uh, the bathroom break. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> everything has been relevant. Um, but yeah, Raj, any any other questions? Like, because uh, you know, just maybe not really if it relates to entrepreneurship or anything else. But so again, like I consider you a mentor of mine, as somebody who I was able to spend a lot of time with early on, and and was able to not only understand from a business standpoint, like you know, hey, you got to be cutthroat and and kind of like you know, very firm in what you know, but then also you got to be a little fluid, like uh, go with the time. I would love to know, like, with this process, has your like philosophy on life or philosophy on what you do with your life, has, has that changed at all or? Yeah, of course, everything changed. Everything changed. You know, up until last July, I worked 24-7. You know, I didn't take any time off uh, this year. I, so I went to Hawaii on a vacation. I didn't even take my computer uh, last month. I went and I rode my bike around the Ironman course, you know, and all this stuff. That's the first time I've taken a week off since 2007. Okay. <clears throat> um, and, I, and that's when uh, my nephew and I went and climbed Kilimanjaro. So, um, yeah, so everything changed. My the way I view work, the way I view people. I've learned a lot about people. You know, I found out who my friends are. That's for sure, and who's not who I thought was. Um, I, I have yeah, my view towards almost everything has changed. Um, it's I've learned to say no a lot more. I said yes to this because this is so much fun, but if it's not, uh, I say no. Uh, I never did that before. So yes, yeah, you, you can't go through something like, because keep in mind, the early days, I was only talking to doctors who I thought had all the answers. And there's nothing more depressing than talking to an oncologist, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so so I, I, didn't, I didn't think I'd be here now, right? So, uh, so I had to reevaluate, you know, the way I was living my life, for sure. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, it took me so much of my own personal effort to figure out how important lifestyle is <clears throat> in this whole process. But, you know, I've learned a lot, you know, I've, I've, the biggest thing I've learned, the one biggest takeaway for anybody listening to this, I know I've been like talking a lot, but there's, if you don't remember anything else that I said, you know, please remember this in this country, you really have to take control of your health. You have to take control. You got to be the CEO of your health care. Right. You've got to make the decisions. You got to make the tough calls. You know, you got to get multiple opinions. You got to take control and push things through. And sometimes for some people, that's hard to do. They're not assertive personalities. And sometimes you have to be super assertive to make things happen. And and through this process, because so as somebody who's so plugged in with ad, ag tech and with healthcare or health tech startups, any that uh, or are there particular kinds of startups or companies that you have come across through this process, which you think every, like maybe our viewers or, or in general, right? Like for to become the CEO of your own own health, any recommendations on how to do that or what to use? for? That? I'm seeing a lot of companies, you know, that are working on various aspects of this. And it, it's a tough field. You know, we have a big health tech practice. We have a big medical precision medicine practice. And it's tough because it's a highly regulated field. That makes it tough. And most of my companies don't expect to get profitable anyway before they get an exit. But for 
And by the way, the reason for that, you know, if you get profitable, you got to pay taxes. Instead, you just reinvest, you build a big asset that gets sold, you know, on the back end and you get what they call qualified small business stock treatment. So you end up not paying taxes on a lot of that gain or you pay it at a low rate. So I don't see companies get profitable, but the trouble, the difference with biotech is that you got to make such huge investments in just even getting there, just getting a product on the market, you know? So um, it's, it's a tough field in that respect. And like I've, I've said that about agriculture, how tough it is because it's, it's competitive, it's regulated, you know, et cetera. Um, but um, med medicine has its own set of challenges to try to, to try to get in and disrupt things. So it, it, it's, it's, I think it's a tough business. And, what I, and, I, and, and for my biotech companies, what I found with ag tech, I keep telling people, you got to have somebody with domain experience on your team. You know, you just have to. You're, you're not, otherwise you're going to end up continuing to create stuff that solves problems that don't exist. I think it's kind of the same in medicine. You got to have people who have domain experience, who understand the medical system or understand the treatment or the disease, or they, you know, you, you really have to understand what, what it is you're attacking. Um, but I'm confident that it will happen. Uh, now I've, all I've done here today is point out a bunch of problems. I haven't given you any solutions. You know, that's for someone with a higher pay grade than me. You know, I'm just telling you, these are the problems. Now, some smart entrepreneur out there in the audience ought to say, I'm your huckleberry. I got a solution for that. I can fix that problem. You got to end on Tombstone. <laughs> got to end on Tombstone. Well, let's say if we if we do end up finding or a, if we have a viewer or a listener right now who does have a potential solution or let's say would like to connect with you, how can they find you? How do they find me? Well, I'm not hiding. You just Google my name, Roger Royce, Royce with an S. Uh, I'm at Haynes Boone uh, all over the all over the Internet. Uh, or just email me at roger.royce at haynesboone.com. And uh, happy to, and I, and I talk to almost anybody, you know, if you got a good idea. Fantastic. Um, well, last point on that. If they do have a good idea, I'd love one point on, because I, I know you get pitched 24 seven from people you do know and people you don't know. Any, any tips for like, if there is a, a viewer or a listener who has an idea that, could be good or could be bad regardless any tips on how to pitch to somebody like you on email or or for the media yeah i'm i'm, I'm super process oriented i, I want to see just the facts um so what i tell people is uh, and usually i just give them a template i say fill out this form so i want to make sure i want to i want the really important facts number one do you have traction right do you got customers has anyone paid you for this yet you know, can you, if you sold one, if you sold one and maybe you can sell a hundred. Okay. Um, do you have IP? What is it? You know, how are you going to keep other people from doing this? Keep them out of the market, you know, and who's your team? You know, th those are kind of the big three, you know, it's just a team that, that, because when you, because, because, because I'm the first, I'm the gatekeeper, maybe I'm the point of entry, but we're going to go to a professional investor and they're going to look at your company, which I know you think is unique. But there's probably other companies doing something similar, or at least trying to solve the same problem. And one of the, and they're going to look at these metrics. You're not a kidding, they are. And I'm not saying you're out of, you know, you're out if you don't have them. I just want to know that we got a path to get there. Um, like team, for example, if, if you've got a good team, you know, if your team has a better track record than the team for the other company that's doing the exact same thing, who do you think the investor is going to bet on? So. So if that's where you're lacking, we need to build that up. We need to get you some advisors, right? So you can say, look, we've got a team. If it's IP, if that's important to your company. So anyway, I, I want just the facts to start with because a lot of times you can identify and you can weed companies out pretty quickly or at least say, look, go back to the drawing board. And you know what? Uh, you only get really, it's very true. You only get one shot at a lot of investors. You want to put your best foot forward. You know, you want to solve the obvious problems. And then my process is if I go talk to other investors, you know, I'm going to get feedback. That's the first thing I want. It's like, look, what am I not seeing here? Uh, so the company can go work on it. 
And a, a big point, which I think the 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 longer you spend with a lawyer as yourself, you realize the value around not just the legal and the advisory side, but then it's also the super connector aspect. I feel like especially Silicon Valley lawyers are the bona fide super connectors. Like yeah. there's nobody better. Yeah, yeah. We, well, that's that's one benefit of living a long time, you know. Um, and I am extremely old, so I know a lot of people. Uh, and and you're right. It, it it does take a you know. You really want that. You really want that because you know there's a lawyer behind every tree in this in this valley. You know you're not, and they're all good. You know you're not going to have any trouble finding really good legal representation. But you know you might want a little bit of market you know market knowledge. Right. And a little bit of knowing who the players are and, uh, you know, and access to those players and access. Yeah. And access. Now, I'm not a broker or a dealer, so I don't I can't come out and say that's what I do because that's not what I do. I'm a lawyer. But um, a warm referral is the best thing you can have. By the way, warm referral from an entrepreneur who is somebody who has invested in is the best referral. Second best is a warm referral from an advisor like me to a company because I put my name on it. I put my seal of approval on it. Every time I call these guys, if I send them a, if I send them a dog, man, they're not going to take my call anymore. They're going to block my number. So I have to be pretty careful about it. And they know that, you know, they know that I'm not just, you know, just shotgunning them. I'm, I'm sure there's years and years of relationship building and stuff, which a lot of founders end up not necessarily taking for granted, but uh, you know, it, it's it's it takes a village. It takes a process, and it it you can lose all that earned up trust very very quickly. Um, so dealing with somebody like you to to give the those hard truths. Um, uh, uh, your lawyer and your CFO, in my opinion, if they can't tell you to your face that you are fucking up, they're they're not the right people for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Raj, any any last questions or any last points? No, I love it all. Hey, well, uh, we like to end uh, each segment. So we tend to interview people that we know we work with uh, at Startup Studios just because like it, it brings in not only the personal side uh, uh, of the relationship, but then also kind of how you know, the good and the bad about it. But in Roger, with your case, when when Raj and I were thinking about this podcast and and you know what kind of audience we wanted, by far in in my book, you were the number one guest I wanted on there. Not only from the standpoint of the 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 wisdom and the the support that you've given me personally as a dumbass like young founder, I we Raj and I met when I was twenty four, maybe twenty five. And there was never any sense of like, listen, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. It was a lot of encouragement it, where we were wrong or my, my co-founders and I were wrong. It was a very simple process of, hey, if we do this, these are some of the outputs. If we do something like if you stay along this path, this is what based on my industry knowledge and my expertise is going to happen. And sometimes you just need somebody who can. And on the flip side, OK, it's like. Usually lawyers are also, you you, uh, you tend to uh, consider them to be very, very expensive. That every time you're going to reach out to them, they're, they're, they're just going to be billing you up left and right. And that you can't really go to them for what you consider to be simpler questions. With Roger, that was never a problem. It was probably a reason why he, he uh, you know, gave us a lot of goodwill over four years. But um all, all the flowers to you, Roger, um, as as a mentor, as an advisor, as a friend. I, I know when I moved to Pakistan, I was in a really weird spot and, you know, uh, kind of uh, focused on building a fund and being a VC and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're, we reconnected. I'm I'm so glad that you were able to give us this, this time and all this uh, this insight. And um, by far, when I whenever I talk to new founders and when they ask about, like, you know what to consider from their law lawyer or somebody or as a super connector you are by far the the uh the person that comes uh, into mind every time as the person that they should have so thank you so much uh for everything i know you you've helped a ton of people in the bay area and in in silicon valley and startups in general and um 
force to be reckoned with in the, the startup, the U.S. startup ecosystem. And I hope uh, you know, uh, with all this going on in your personal life and stuff, I know that like, you're, you're going to work through it. But um, yeah, like uh, thank you. Thank you for everything. Man. All right. Well, thank you. This was really fun. Thanks for having me on your show. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Robert. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again with another episode next week, but uh, we'll see you then.